Hi. The new Biodiversity Conservation Bills are the government's response to its Biodiversity Review Panel. The panel was given six months to get across four laws, to put out an issues paper, to receive public submissions, review those and come up with its recommendations. The panel was given three terms of reference, to cut red tape, to conserve biodiversity and to facilitate ecologically sustainable development or ESD. In short, ESD means the proper integration of environmental, social and economic considerations in decision making by government and by others. It also means maintaining or improving the health, diversity and productivity of our environment for future generations. The panel delivered its report in December 2014 with 43 recommendations. So do the draft bills add up to a better system? One that will reverse biodiversity declines and one that shares the costs and benefits of land clearing and conservation. We think these bills miss a real opportunity to do things better. Current environmental laws aren't perfect, but the laws themselves aren't to blame for ongoing species loss. The real problems lie elsewhere. For urban clearing, the Planning Act continues to trump the Threatened Species Conservation Act, especially for major projects. So impacts are assessed, but we don't set consistent standards up front or identify what matters in the short and long term. For rural clearing, we strongly support ongoing and increased funding to farmers to maintain or improve native vegetation on their properties. But the initial bucket of money to pay for property vegetation plans and incentives under the current laws ran out, just as the bucket of money on offer this time could run out as well. I'm going to briefly highlight parts of the reforms that carry over existing laws and some of the major changes. I'll finish up with what we see as 10 missed opportunities for the current reforms. Firstly, parts of the regime that are carried over. First, the scientific listing processes for threatened species and ecological communities will continue more or less in the same way. Second, government decision makers will still have discretion when approving land clearing and development on biodiversity, especially for major projects. Third, routine agricultural management is left to landholders as it is now under the Native Vegetation Act. The Native Veg Act already allows clearing for things like fencing, dams, removing noxious weeds and pests, and various other things without having to get approval. These routine agricultural management activities, or RAMAs, will be called allowable activities under the LLS Bill. Moving on to some of the major changes. First I'll look at the Biodiversity Conservation Bill and then I'll look at the LLS Bill for Rural Clearing. The Biodiversity Conservation Bill would repeal and replace several laws. The Threatened Species Conservation Act for those threatened species listing and assessment processes. The Nature Conservation Trust Act for private land conservation. Parts of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act or the Planning Act relating to biodiversity impact assessment. And parts of the National Parks and Wildlife Act on wildlife licensing and offences to plants and animals. The government proposes to expand its biodiversity assessment and offsetting scheme currently reserved for major projects like mines, factories, hospitals and roads to other larger scale urban and rural land clearing, including clearing that isn't available under the LLS codes, which I'll get to. The new method, the biodiversity assessment method or BAM, allows a much heavier reliance on offsetting loss, either by protecting other land directly or paying money to a government trust to conserve nature elsewhere. We're concerned that the BAM carries over some of the weakest standards that are currently available and doesn't stick to the robust rules that are necessary to ensure offsetting has a chance to work. Moving to private land conservation, the Biodiversity Conservation Bill would establish a new trust to manage private conservation funding. The Trust would seek agreements with landholders to voluntarily protect priority ecosystems funded by $240 million over the first five years. This will boil down to three types of agreements. Tier 1 is the Biodiversity Stewardship Agreements, which protect land for the long term, including by generating biodiversity offset credits that uh, can be used to pay for um, land clearing elsewhere. Secondly, Conservation Agreements which may be time limited, would apply to existing high conservation value land and may be eligible for smaller payments. 
And third tier is the wildlife refuge agreements, which are more entry level agreements and don't necessarily run with the land when the land is sold. Existing private land conservation agreements, if you have one, will be carried over and the government is saying there'll be options to transfer those agreements to some of those new options that I've mentioned. We strongly support higher investment in stewardship payments to landholders, especially in light of federal funding cuts to land care. But we think funding must be supported by rules and targets that stop valuable biodiversity being gradually lost. Let's turn now to rural clearing under the Local Land Services Bill. The Local Land Services Amendment Act and new clearing codes would replace the Native Veg Act, routine agricultural management activities and property vegetation plans, of which there are over a thousand across New South Wales in place under the current scheme. New clearing rules will apply to the same local government areas as now, but new maps which are yet to be seen will show which parts of rural properties can be cleared without regulation. So this is kind of equivalent to what we now call unprotected regrowth on the current system. And the maps will also show which parts of properties need to follow the new clearing rules under the LLS bill. I want to focus for a moment on the clearing codes under the LLS bill because we think this is where there'll be a significant amount of additional clearing. The four new sets of land clearing codes include much looser land clearing rules. Some clearing impacts can be self-assessed with notification to the local land services, or LLS, and larger code-based clearing will need LLS sign-off or certification. We're concerned these codes will increase broad-scale land clearing, and that's certainly what we've seen in Queensland over the last few years. Importantly, the current Native Veg Act aims to maintain or improve environmental outcomes, and these are measured as biodiversity, soil quality, water quality, and salinity. This test hasn't been carried over under the new system, either at a property scale or at a regional scale. We're also concerned that the codes allow clearing of endangered ecological communities. These are groups of species that are at a very high risk of extinction over the medium term, so perhaps the next 50 years. Under the proposed system, codes that require LLS certification may also require set-asides on, on other parts of the property to be managed in exchange for clearing remnant bush. We think it's going to be very hard for set-asides to achieve the same ecosystem functions as the remnant vegetation that's being cleared, so things like hollow-bearing trees for threatened species and other species, and retaining soil carbon. We'd rather see greater stewardship payments than greater clearing. So in conclusion, let's talk about 10 things that biodiversity law reform should do. First, they should be designed to prevent extinction. The proposed goals aren't clear or specific enough in that regard. Second, to be equitable, we should apply a maintain or improve standard to all development. So if we expect farmers to maintain or improve environmental outcomes, we should certainly expect the same of other landholders. These bills don't do either. Third, we should address key threats such as cumulative impacts, broad-scale land clearing of remnant vegetation and climate change, none of which are dealt with effectively in the bills. Fourth, we should establish a New South Wales Environment Commission or a Biodiversity Commissioner to provide advice and oversight on an independent basis, and an example of that is the Ontario Biodiversity Council. We should also mandate the use of leading practice, scientifically robust assessment tools, not carry over the tool with the weaker standards, which is the one that's been reflected in the ban. We should be investing more in private land conservation and the proposed reforms do propose to do this. The laws should require comprehensive data, monitoring and reporting on biodiversity and vegetation, the condition of that vegetation and the trends in that vegetation. So that's known as environmental accounting and the panel actually recommended that that be done but we're not seeing any of that in the bills. We should also limit indirect offsetting that doesn't protect the species and ecosystems that are affected by the clearing. We need to commit to compliance and enforcement and we need to properly resource natural resource management bodies to work with landholders to have the expertise to do the assessments and to make natural resource management plans that relate to clear targets. Thank you very much for listening. I would have loved to have joined the panel discussion, but we are trying to write our own submission this week and we couldn't be everywhere at once. 
but I wish you well in writing your own submissions to the government and uh, a fruitful discussion today. Thanks very much. For more information, you can visit our website at www.edonsw.org.au. Cheers.